Hello and welcome to the fourth Oxford Archaeology Research Seminar, which will explore the settlements and landscapes of Roman Britain, highlighting work by Oxford Archaeology on Roman rural settlements in both northern and southern England, and investigate themes of organisation, economy, regionality, change and continuity. Firstly, Martin Allen will provide an overview of the Roman Rural Settlement Project, highlighting some broad but key regional differences in settlement patterns within different parts of Britain, and providing the context for the following talks, which will provide a more detailed analysis of settlements in northern and southern England, respectively. John Zant will then talk about Roman period rural settlement in the northwest of England, as illustrated by the results of five investigations carried out in the region by Oxford Archaeology North two Romanized extramural settlements associated with the forts at Maryport and Broome, and three investigations of broadly contemporary indigenous settlement sites in Lancashire. Although relatively little work has been carried out on such settlements in the region, these sites illustrate the marked differences between these settlement types, both physically in terms of layout, building types, etc., and culturally. Edward Bidolf will then focus on the Roman landscape of the Vale of Whitehorse in Oxfordshire, looking in some depth at the various sites investigated by Oxford Archaeology, South and others in the Wantage area, including those at Crab Hill and Grove Airfield, to demonstrate how combining the evidence is essential to providing a better understanding of the relationships between sites, the organisation of settlements and their hinterland, the economic basis of the area, social differences and the wider environment. I'm delighted to say that we will then be joined by our panel, consisting of Dr. Lacey Wallace, Senior Lecturer in Roman History at the University of Lincoln, Dr. Nick Hodgson, Honorary Fellow at, the Durham, at Durham University, Dr. Steve Willis, Senior Lecturer in Archaeology at the University of Kent, Dr. Ellery Cousins, Lecturer in Roman History at Lancaster University, and Paddy Lambert, a Project Officer at Oxford Archaeology East. They will be discussing these issues in more detail, so please send in your questions during the seminar and they will do their best to answer them. But first, I'll hand over to Dr. Martin Allen, who will talk about Settlement and Landscape in Roman Britain, a regional review of the Roman Rural Settlement Project. Martin. The Roman Rural Settlement Project came about as a collaboration between the University of Reading and Cotswold Archaeology, with funding from the Leverhulme Trust with the primary aim of quantifying and analysing the huge amount of information generated from excavations on Roman rural settlements in England and Wales over the past century or so, and particularly since 1990 to take account of the vast data set that has resulted from the commercialisation of archaeology as part of the planning system. After some initial groundwork, the project began officially in 2012 and ended in 2018, following the production and publication of an extensive online database and three monographs covering various elements of rural settlement in Roman Britain. The timing of the project came at something of a watershed in terms of the long history of the study of Roman Britain. Francis Haverfield's 1912 publication of the Romanization of Roman Britain is often cited as the birth of the modern academic discipline which sought to understand how the population engaged with and emulated Roman culture as Britain became part of this very imposing and powerful political entity. It is fair to say that throughout much of the earlier 20th century, research on Roman Britain remained focused on the establishments of the elite in the Roman countryside, which sat very comfortably alongside the study of Roman towns and the military. The Roman villa, often seen as a provincial institution borrowed from the rural elite on the continent, especially Italy, was then central to our understanding of the British countryside, seemingly to the detriment of the vast majority of the population. Drawing upon textual evidence from the continent, the economic and legal status of the Romano-British peasantry were discussed by Collingwood as early as the 1930s, despite a clear lack of excavated non-villa residences. By the 1960s, publication of a series of conference papers entitled Rural Settlement in Roman Britain was the first attempt to highlight regional variation without focusing on particular elements of the settlement landscape. However, despite the sea change, synthetic studies continue to draw upon much the same evidence that Collingwood had been working with since the 1930s and treating it within a historically driven narrative. 
A fundamental shift in this approach came via Martin Millet's much later 1990 publication, The Romanization of Britain, which was one of the first to preference the archaeological evidence. Coincidentally, this came in the same year as the implementation of PPG 16, forerunner to the National Planning Policy Framework, which provided archaeological sites for protection from commercial development effectively shifting the responsibility for their protection or mitigation during construction works from the state to the developers. It also saw the onset of the professionalization of the industry, not only of excavation, but also of specialist post-excavation work, such as artifactual studies, human osteology, zoo archaeology, and archaeobotany. And together, these related disciplines would give rise to an avalanche of new archaeological data over the next few decades. Just prior to the inception of the Roman Rural Settlement Project, Jeremy Taylor's pioneering publication, An Atlas of Roman Rural Settlement in England, was a first attempt at pulling together a national data set of NMR data, including information from excavations, aerial and ground surveys, and was estimated at the time to have identified around 28,000 individual settlements. The study was revolutionary from the point of view that it went beyond traditional site classifications, largely based upon architectural attributes, and moved towards a consideration of wider settlement morphology. Taylor's work provided the backdrop for the Roman Rural Settlement Project, which moved quite deliberately towards a very different analytical approach. While results from aerial and ground surveys could provide extensive coverage of the Roman landscape across much of Britain, it lacks considerable information with regards to dating and chronology, something that can only reliably be achieved through systematic excavation, a method that also brings into play the post-excavation disciplines just mentioned, because they provide information on not only what settlements looked like, but how people acted and engaged within them. The project examined all types of rural site in England and Wales, thus reaching just north of Hadrian's Wall, and focused on almost exclusively excavated data, only drawing upon geophysics results or soil or crop mark data where they have been uh, directly related to excavations. These data were gathered as exhaustively as possible from published sources and unpublished grey literature, gratefully enlisted the help of each and every one of the county and district historic environment records offices across England and Wales. Following data collection, which took three people about three years to complete, eight regions were defined that did away with modern political boundaries and focused instead on natural geographical attributes and preliminary patterns apparent in the archaeological data. These regions include the South, the Southwest, the Central Belt, the East, the Northeast, the Central West, Wales, and the Marches, and the North. It is important to stress that these regions have no basis in terms of late Iron Age or Romano British cultural geography, and they instead should be seen as providing a suitable framework for analysing the data. To compare and contrast individual data set, it was important to classify settlement types. While traditional typologies such as villas and roadside settlements were still useful, it was also necessary to consider the now overwhelming number of farmsteads within their immediate hinterland. We developed classifications that are built upon Jeremy Taylor's work by analysing the structural morphology around the domestic focus of each settlement. Accounting for settlement boundaries and complexity allowed for a tripartite system of open, enclosed, and complex farmsteads to be categorised. The beauty of this system is that it allows for villa sites to be analysed alongside other farmsteads, while also considering them as separate elements of the landscape as necessary. Open and enclosed farmsteads are felt fairly self-explanatory, but the identification of complex farmsteads, settlements which are effectively, if not exclusively, a Roman period phenomenon, allow for a much better understanding of how the settlement pattern developed in different parts of Roman Britain over time. These sites are broadly characterised by the association of a domestic focus, either within a large enclosure with significant division of internal space, or an agglomeration of multiple conjoined enclosures, usually with defined trackways and often set within nearby larger field systems. 
The complex farmstead phenomenon expanded fairly quickly over the Roman conquest and peaked through the second to fourth centuries AD. Their presence suggests a more integrated and interconnected pattern of settlement with more intensive exploitation of local resources, mostly agricultural, but also industrial practices in some cases. To standardize and quantify the data set in terms of rural settlement morphology, we reviewed and reassessed several thousand site plans. Morphological classification was not always possible and sometimes relied upon additional help from geophysical surveys and crop or soil marks where present. Enclosed farmsteads overwhelmingly dominated in the south region during the late Iron Age. Open farmsteads are likely to have been more common than is suggested by the data, as these sites are more difficult to identify when ditches are absent. Both open and enclosed forms, however, reduce in relation to the increasing number of complex farmsteads that became established following the conquest, and by the second century appear to have been the most common form of farmstead in this region a pattern that prevails through to the end of the Roman period. The data suggest a pattern of increasing enclosure and complexity within and around settlements, which is mirrored and even more stark when the data from the central belt is considered, where complex farmsteads in fact become the dominant settlement form from the second century onwards. At some sites, we observe a pattern of change where enclosed farmsteads develop into complex ones. A good example was discovered at Lee Farm near Hurst in Berkshire, where a late Iron Age enclosed settlement was replaced in the early Roman period by a trackway and a system of enclosures with domestic activity on the southwest side, all on the same alignment as the previous settlement, while a ditched field system developed on the northeast side. Whether this represents direct continuity or the abandonment of the late Iron Age settlement and reuse of relict, uh, relict landscape features is open to question. It seems that changes such as this were often associated with the formalization of ditched trackways, which helped to influence developments in local settlement patterns. The presence of trackways would have facilitated local networking, provided increased social and economic interactions between settlements. In some areas, agglomerations of settlement significantly expanded. This is mostly seen at roadside settlements after Roman roads were constructed, but away from these we start to see other examples. On the Salisbury Plain, the expansion of trackways and field systems occurred alongside the development of more extensive village type settlements, effectively agglomerations of multiple farmsteads. Clearly different types of rural settlements developed in different regions, even different sub-regions, where local economic, social and environmental conditions all played a part. By the third century AD, complex farmsteads become the dominant form <clears throat> in the London Basin, where a proliferation of large complexes were established. These types are particularly notable as being located on low-lying ground and were characterised by multiple enclosures, some domestic, some agricultural, as well as trackways and wider field systems. Within the enclosures, waterholes and wells were fairly common, and the settlements appear to have been particularly geared up for intensive livestock management. These settlements are quite different to the enclosure complexes that were more common on the chalk downs of Hampshire and Sussex, for example, which tended to be less extensive and probably represent different styles of animal management. Although fewer in number, larger settlements did exist on the downs, such as the early Roman settlement at Dunkirk Barn in Hampshire which shows a more widespread and integrated pattern of enclosures and trackways, even incorporating elements of the pre-existing late Iron Age landscape in the form of a banjo enclosure. It is worth noting that this settlement later went on to establish a wealthy villa complex within the early Roman boundaries during the third and fourth centuries AD. What we see in the early Roman period is perhaps the beginnings of an estate center where wealth was later invested in architectural construction and material culture. The differences in settlement types found in the varied landscapes of southern Britain is also reflected in certain classes of finds. Given, as suggested, some of this re variation reflects different approaches to livestock management, this is somewhat borne out in the zooarchaeological data. Comparison of cattle, sheep and pig percentages from farmstead sites in the south region show clear differentiation in exploitation patterns. Sheep bones tend to dominate on sites in the southwest downs, 
and more mixed pattern prevails on the Hampshire Downs, while a clear focus on cattle can be found in the London Basin. These two archaeological patterns perhaps reflect directly upon the morphological character of the settlements and the ways in which they managed livestock husbandry in order to exploit the local environment, local economic conditions, and social attitudes to stock rearing. Essentially, the smaller complexes on the chalk downs may have been more suited to far sheep farming, while the extensive London Basin complexes with their water holes and trackways were organised with a focus on cattle rearing. In many ways, the broad pattern of settlement development, increasing complexity and interconnectivity found in the South and the Central Belt regions was to an extent replicated in the Northeast region. This region has a smaller sample of settlements to analyze, but again, there is a clear increase in the proportion of complex farmsteads into the late Roman period. The Northeast is notable for its late Iron Age settlement pattern. The ladder complexes with their long and winding trackways and associated enclosures are of particular interest, since many were established prior to the Roman conquest but continued thereafter, often with modifications along the way. Many of these settlements are known only through aerial survey. They differed in size, but many were extensive uh, with a seemingly coaxial arrangement of enclosures aligned along them. Their morphology is somewhat akin to roadside settlements. But in the absence of formal roads, the larger examples are perhaps best described as villages, probably functioning similar to the large settlements found on the Salisbury Plain. Owing to their exceptional size, few have been extensively excavated. Small-scale excavation on a couple of complexes that extended over a kilometre have demonstrated their longevity, while a more extensive excavation on one at Newbridge Quarry near Pickering demonstrated evidence for domestic activity arable processing and storage, quarrying and human burials, together reflecting the presence of vibrant agricultural communities. The extensive track or droveways linked many of these settlements together and highlights the socially interconnected nature of this landscape, which appears to have been suited to large-scale herding and movement of livestock. Moving to the central west region, the general settlement pattern begins to change. No longer can we really speak about complex farmsteads in the same way as for the south and east of the country, largely owing to far fewer excavated sites overall, and a lower proportion of sites excavated to an extent that allows for settlement morphology to be categorised. In some respects, this is hindered by modern urbanisation in the region, despite the large amount of development and the level of excavation undertaken as reflected in the National Monuments Record Index very few Roman rural settlements have been identified. From the available data sets, we find an apparent increase in the number of occupied farmsteads from the late Iron Age to the later second century, before a retraction through to the end of the fourth century. Interestingly, there is some variation in the chronological distribution of farmsteads between different subregions. For example, a higher proportion of settlements on the coal measures were occupied between the late Iron Age and the end of the second century after which there was a fairly dramatic decline. In contrast, an early Roman increase in settlement numbers in the Mears and Mosses, Shropshire Hills area appears to have occurred more slowly towards a late second century peak that was more or less maintained through to the fourth century. The causes of this variation are difficult to identify, but appear to be linked to, an, to a series of new establishments in the Mears and Mosses area during the second century. While it is difficult to quantify Roman uh, rural settlement morphology in the Central West region, it is currently recognised that simple enclosed farmsteads are the dominant form. These can vary in terms of size and shape and the number and enormity of the boundary ditches. It has been suggested that such variation was linked to chronology. However, there are not enough well-dated excavated sites available to prove this statistically. The relative lack of more complex farmsteads is notable, but they do exist. For example, at Langley Lane in the West Midlands, where a sequence of complex development was identified that appeared to respect the location of a mid to late Iron Age enclosure. Buildings and halves were discovered alongside pits and post holes. Although material culture was relatively scant, limited largely to a knife, nails, and a few quernstones. 
The general lack of material culture at farmsteads in this region is epitomised when compared to finds data from roadside settlements and villas. The range and frequency of artefacts is very limited at farmsteads, largely restricted to utilitarian items such as tools, textile equipment, coinstones and a small number of coins, while more extravagant items such as finger rings, hairpins, lighting equipment and religious items are generally absent from the excavated sites. This pattern is broadly mirrored in the North region, Wales and the South West. It contrasts markedly with regions in the South of England, where although material culture is still more focused towards roadside settlements and villas, its proliferation into the countryside is much more apparent, with a wider distribution of artefacts being recovered from farmstead sites. The apparent disconnect between the majority of the rural population and the wider Roman market economy in the north and west is perhaps best seen in the densities of pottery recovered from farmsteads in eastern, central and southern England. The relatively aceramic character of the north and west suggests that most people were consuming material culture in a very different way. Part of this pattern may be due to the continued use of organic items as containers in the north and west, which further suggests differing attitudes to Roman material culture in these regions. The settlement pattern in the north region is even more difficult to char characterise in the absence of a larger data set, but interesting elements have clearly emerged across an area that is otherwise dominated by military sites. We also took account of Viki sites as, as rural settlements associated with forts, although I won't go into the detail about these here. In terms of chronology, a notable aspect of the data concerns the impact of the construction of Hadrian's Wall. Since we collected data from across England and therefore to the north of the wall, we were able to identify the clear reduction in the number of known settlements inhabited in the third and fourth centuries AD compared to those to its south. While we should be cautious of the dating evidence owing to the general lack of material culture and its ability to provide high resolution dating evidence, differences in settlement density north and south of the wall have previously been noted. One possibility forwarded by Nick Hodgson is that there may have been a deliberate depopulation or movement of communities southward. While it is tempting to draw upon historical evidence, which discusses major military incursions around AD 180, perhaps causing instability in this zone, there is little evidence that any settlements came to a violent end. Despite the relative lack of evidence, we now have good excavated examples of some complete farmsteads that suggest relative complexity in settlement morphology, such as the large enclosure at Blagdon Park in Northumberland which so shows internal division and differentiation in the use of space. While such a site is not comparable to the often sprawling complex farmsteads found in the south, the site displays a level of complexity which perhaps singles it out from many other sites in this region, perhaps socially and economically. While I've painted only a very broad brush picture of settlement patterns in different parts of Britain so far, with much more detail and other areas which can be covered, the evidence presented here begins to shine a light on the complexity and variation apparent right across the country, and indeed, even within and between local landscapes. The Roman Rural Settlement Database and the analyses undertaken on it so far provide a canvas that presents our current picture of the Romano-British landscape with all its nuance, and yet there is considerable scope to continue the work to fill in the gaps, to add more layers of data over what has been shown before, to provide extra clarity to our view of the past. One thing that is true is that the data set opens up many areas for discussion, and we have here only scratched the surface of the data collected. Alongside settlement morphology, an understanding of settlement densities is key to understanding social and economic patterns and ideas about interconnectedness in different landscapes. Although the data remain biased by factors such as the location and intensity of modern development, which obviously leads us to excavate in certain areas more so than others, we do begin to see patterns emerge which highlight the much more densely populated South and Central Belt regions, followed by settlement densities in the East and Northeast regions, which compare to the relative lack of settlements per square kilometre 
in regions to the north and west. We can point to modern development, but as already been shown, the major differences in settlement types, settlement morphology, and indeed in other types of evidence signify that these were very different places in which people lived. Ideas about whether these differences reflect positive or negative impact are open to question. How did these variations affect and impact on people's everyday lives? The so-called late Roman golden era in southern Britain should perhaps be called into question once we start thinking about issues such as slavery and the impact of large landed estates on the local populace. Was this a good place to live? Here, now, with the level of data at our disposal, which is constantly being added to, we can really push on in creating new, more precise understandings of Roman rural Britain. Thank you very much. In this short paper, I'm going to focus on recent work by Oxford Archaeology North in Northwest England, rather than casting my net more widely across the whole of the Roman North. This is partly because the North West is where much of the company's work has been carried out, but it's also an attempt to draw attention to a region that has historically seen very little research into Romana British rural settlement, and which is consequently underrepresented in the national data set. Simply put, there are two main types of rural settlement known from the Roman Northwest. The extramural settlements, or Vici, that grew up outside most of the region's forts, are what might be termed the native settlements, principally farmsteads, in which the great bulk of the population would have lived. In order to compare and contrast the two settlement types, I will briefly review the results of excavations undertaken by Oxford Archaeology North on the Vicky at Maryport on the Cumbrian coast and at Broome near Penrith, and at three previously unknown native settlements in Lancashire. Like most Vicky in the northwest, the settlements at Maryport and Broome, the locations of which are shown here, have been known about in general terms for centuries and many antiquarian discoveries have been made at both sites, though no significant investigations were conducted during the 20th century. It's worth noting that whilst almost all the forts shown on this plan would have had an associated vicus, very few have been subject to anything other than small-scale modern excavation, most attention having been given to the forts themselves. This slide shows the results of an extensive geophysical survey undertaken about 20 years ago over the settlement at Maryport. As can be seen, this generated a highly detailed plan of what was clearly a large planned village, characterized by narrow building plots extending for 300 meters or more on both sides of the road leading north from the fort. The regularity of the layout and the lack of any evidence for pre-Roman Iron Age activity suggests the settlement was laid out on a greenfield site by a centralized authority, presumably the Roman military. The intention doubtless being to attract settlers who would provide goods and services to the fort garrison, and maybe to provide homes and land for retired veterans and their families. Unlike some other Viki, there's currently no good evidence for extensive settlement on any other side of the fort. On the street frontage, most of the plots appear to be occupied by rectangular buildings, with the areas to the rear being more open. One of these plots, located about 150 metres north of the fort, was selected for investigation by Oxford Archaeology North in 2013-2014 as part of a community research project, with most of the digging and recording being carried out by volunteers. The work revealed the remains of a timber frame strip building, 16 metres long and 5 metres wide, of three structural phases, the earliest dating to the reign of Hadrian, and thus contemporary with the establishment of the stone fort, the latest illustrated here, in use during the 3rd century. Like the earlier phases, this structure had three rooms arranged in a row, but unlike its predecessors, which were of post-entrench construction, it had stone footings. However, these were insubstantial, suggesting that the building may have had a wooden superstructure, as shown in this reconstruction by my colleague Marie Rowland. The provision of an upper story is hypothetical, based on the discovery in the corner of one of the rooms of a stone foundation that may have supported a wooden staircase or a ladder. As suggested by the geophysics, the area behind the building was largely open, the principal features there being a few probable rubbish pits and several vertical sided rectangular features, possibly cisterns or wells. 
The work at Broome was carried out prior to the construction of a pipeline south of the fort. This slide shows the fort platform viewed from the south, its northwest corner overlaid by the medieval castle. The pipeline extended east to west across the field that is just visible at the bottom of the slide, south of the minor road. Nothing was previously known of this area, but antiquarian records indicated that extensive settlement remains lay east and north of the fort. The work on the pipeline revealed the main road leading south from the fort, from which minor roads or lanes extended east and west, forming a simple rectilinear street grid, as depicted in this reconstruction by my colleague Adam Parsons. As at Maryport, the road was fronted by timber structures of the strip building type, an architectural form that is more or less ubiquitous at Romanized settlements such as Vichy and towns, and which was clearly a Roman import to the region since rectilinear buildings are virtually unknown in the pre-Roman Iron Age of the Northwest. The building shown here, which is fairly typical of the structures excavated at Broome, has a very obvious entrance, flanked by stone pads for the doorposts and a rubble platform in one corner, possibly the foundation for a stair or a ladder, as at Maryport. Although the number of inhabitants of the Viki at Maryport and Broome is unknown, at their peak the population of each must have been in the hundreds, and the same can probably be said of the region's other Viki. The demographic composition of these settlements is unclear in detail, but it might be supposed that the inhabitants included many individuals from elsewhere in the Roman Empire, including traders and retired soldiers, as well as Britons attracted by the economic and social opportunities afforded by interaction with the soldiers. That this was the case is suggested by inscriptions from many Viki, recording the presence of people from other provinces, for example Greek speakers at Maryport and at Broome individuals with names possibly indicating an origin in one of the Danubian provinces. The precise function of the excavated buildings at both sites is unclear, as none yielded any diagnostic artefacts that might suggest a particular purpose. Possibly they were multifunctional, with in some cases at least a shop on the street frontage and workshops and accommodation to the rear or in an upper story. Presumably, many of the inhabitants of the regions of Vicky made a living by providing goods and services to the soldiers, though farming may have remained an important economic activity for some. At Maryport, geophysical evidence suggests the existence of field systems around the village, whilst at Broome the pipeline traversed areas peripheral to the settlement core where many features suggestive of a managed agricultural landscape were found, including field boundary ditches and several waterholes such as the one illustrated here. Extremely poor survival of animal bones, a feature of most sites in the region, and a scarcity of charred plant remains, severely limits what can be said of the farming economy at these sites. But at both a few bones of cattle and sheep were present, together with limited evidence for the cultivation of wheat and barley. Both sites yielded large quantities of Roman cultural material, particularly pottery. Approximately 6,000 shares were recovered from the single building plot at Maryport, and nearly 10,000 came from Broome. But also glassware, metalwork and coins, the latter evidence of at least some cash-based transactions. The pottery includes many imported forms such as Samian ware and wine amphorae from Gaul, olive oil amphorae from Spain and beakers from the Rhineland as well as vessels manufactured elsewhere in Britain. In fact, the wider evidence from northern Viki suggests that the pottery assemblages are similar to those from the adjacent forts, indicating that those living in these settlements were able to access military supply networks. Perhaps surprisingly, little overtly military equipment was recovered from either Maryport or Broome, one of the few exceptions being this fist-sized lump of chain mail from Maryport. Whilst it's the case that relatively little archaeological work has been carried out until recently on the Viki of the Northwest, the data set was considerably larger than that available for the region's native settlements. Indeed, in the past, the lack of evidence for sites of this type has led some to suppose that the region was sparsely settled during the Roman period. However, it now seems clear that site invisibility has less to do with low population density than with the generally insubstantial nature of the sites themselves and the fact that much of the region's better agricultural land is now under pasture or built over, which inhibits the identification of sites from the air. 
While some attempts were made during the 20th century to address the imbalance in research, it was only with the expansion of developer-funded archaeological work in the 1990s that significant opportunities arose to investigate the rural landscape of the northwest. With routine evaluation of construction sites as part of the planning process, revealing sites that would have otherwise remained invisible. The three settlements investigated by Oxford Archaeology North in Lancashire, located on this plan, are good examples of this, with one at Poulton le Fylde near Blackpool being exposed by a new pipeline, another at Barker House Farm, a few kilometres south of Lancaster, found during building works at the university, and a third discovered on the site of a new housing development east of Preston. The most obvious characteristic of these sites is the continued use of the roundhouse, such as this one at Poulton. This is consistent with the wider evidence from the north, where roundhouses remained in widespread use to the late Roman period at least. Two such structures were found at Barker House Farm, with two or possibly three at Poulton, and at least two at Preston East, though the latter site also contained several fragmentary gullies and curving alignments of posts that might represent other poorly preserved structures. However, there's no way of knowing if all the buildings at any given site were in use at the same time, nor is it likely that the entirety of each settlement was exposed. Consequently, there are limits to what can be confidently said about their size and organisation. Most of the roundhouses, including these examples at Preston East, were 8 to 9 metres in diameter, which is the most common size for roundhouses in the region. This example at Barker House Farm, though, had a diameter of over 15 metres. There was nothing to indicate that the investigated buildings had anything other than a domestic function, though it's unlikely that all roundhouses in the region were actually houses, and there's some evidence that some structures may have served as agricultural buildings or workshops. Apart from the roundhouses themselves, occupation features were relatively sparse, being mostly limited to a few pits, post holes, and gully fragments. Recent research has suggested that many of the North native sites fall into three broad categories, namely open settlements, where there's no obvious boundary enclosing the settled area, enclosed, where the domestic core is contained within a ditched enclosure, and complex sites, often characterised by systems of conjoined enclosures. Whilst this is likely to be an oversimplification, it is possible that the Lancashire sites discussed here represent examples of each of these types. At Preston East, shown here, there was no evidence that the investigated structures lay within an enclosure, so it's possible this was an open site, though in truth the excavated area was too small for certainty. At Barker House Farm, on the other hand, it's fairly certain that the roundhouses stood within a rectilinear enclosure, evidenced within the site by a substantial V-shaped ditch forming the west side of the enclosure, to the left of the roundhouses on this plan. This feature was also visible as a crop mark, as was the north side of the enclosure, which was not excavated. The most complex arrangement was found at Poulton, shown here, where the roundhouses were located in two of at least four conjoined rectilinear ditched enclosures. The westernmost enclosure had a gated entrance evidenced by this square post hole setting, approached by a ditch trackway. When considering the morphology of these sites, it might be asked how they can be assigned to the Romano-British period rather than, say, the pre-Roman Iron Age. All three sites yielded small amounts of Roman pottery, but the best evidence is provided by a series of radiocarbon dates from multiple contexts at Barker House Farm and Poulton, which demonstrate that both sites were occupied during the 2nd century AD and maybe into the first half of the 3rd century. No scientific dating is currently available from Preston East, but the small pottery assemblage is broadly of this period. Apart from the two or three radiocarbon dates spanning the middle to late Iron Age at Poulton and Barker House Farm, there's no indication that any of these sites were occupied before the Roman period nor is there any evidence for activity beyond the mid-3rd century AD. In marked contrast to the Viki, artefacts were extremely scarce, being confined to small collections of Roman pottery and a few pieces of rotary querns. The pottery sherds all derived from Romanized vessels, 
there being little evidence for native pottery production in the region at this time. The largest collection, some 170 sherds, came from Polton, which, coincidentally or not, also seems to have been the most complex of the three sites. By contrast, Barker House Farm and Preston East each yielded only five sherds, despite the fact they were located no great distance from the important Roman settlements at Lancaster and Walton Liddell respectively, and only a few hundred metres from a major Roman road connecting these sites. Unlike the Vichy, the economy and fortunes of which were clearly inextricably linked with the Roman military, the inhabitants of the native sites appear to have had little access to lo local Roman market centres and did not engage in any meaningful way with military supply networks. Why this should have been is, however, open to question. On the one hand, it may be the majority of native peoples, operating largely within a subsistence-based economy, could not afford Roman goods, or they may have been in some way excluded from accessing the necessary markets and supply networks. Alternatively, the limited take-up of Roman material culture might have been the result of deliberate choice, whereby many communities simply, simply felt no need to acquire such goods. Although preservation of paleo environmental materials was extremely poor at all sites, the survival of a few fragments of cattle and sheep bones, together with charred remains of spelt wheat and barley, including some crop processing waste, suggests that mixed farming formed the economic base for these communities, as seems to have been the case across most of the rural north in both the Iron Age and the Roman period. Excavations elsewhere in northern England including at this site investigated by Oxford Archaeology North on the A66 at Scotch Corner in North Yorkshire, have demonstrated that many settlements of the pre late pre-Roman Iron Age and the Romano-British period lay within extensive and highly organised agricultural landscapes, with domestic enclosures integrated into highly complex systems of fields, droveways and land boundaries. In the northwest, the situation is less clear due to a lack of opportunities for excavation, but there's no reason to suppose that the situation was very different. Indeed, a series of excavations at Stanix in the northern suburbs of Carlisle has revealed evidence for a rectilinear system of arable fields extending over at least 20 hectares, evidenced by plough marks such as these associated with field boundary ditches and buried plough soils. The associated settlement has not been located but the fields themselves appear to have been abandoned as a direct result of the establishment of the Hadrian's Wall frontier system in the AD 120s. There is as yet no clear evidence for a hierarchy of rural settlements in the northwest. It's true that some sites yield more Romanized artifacts than others, but whether this indicates that the inhabitants were wealthier and or of higher status is very uncertain, since, as already mentioned, Differences in the take-up of Roman material culture could be due to other factors, and it's quite possible that wealth and status were displayed in ways that leave little trace in the archaeology of the region, for instance ownership of cattle. Of the three Lancashire sites discussed here, it's notable that the largest collection of Roman pottery came from Polton, which was seemingly the most complex in terms of organisation. However, whether this is significant or merely a coincidence is uncertain, since Polton didn't produce any other artefacts that might hint at a higher status or better access to Roman goods, and the pottery assemblage is very small compared with those from the Vichy. To conclude, therefore, whilst much remains uncertain, it's testimony to the recent work that's been carried out on Roman rural settlement in the northwest that we're now in a position where it's possible to begin to address some of the questions raised in this seminar. Though much more excavation and research is needed, before we can attempt to provide some definitive answers. I'll now hand you over to my colleague Edward Biddulph of Oxford Archaeology South, who will be presenting some case studies pertaining to Roman rural settlement in southern England. Thank you, John, for your fascinating talk on settlement in northwestern England. Now um, we shall turn to southern England. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a case study in Oxfordshire, specifically the area of Grove and Wantage, which is um, another very interesting area in terms of settlement. It lies within the Vale of Whitehorse in the Upper Thames Valley. 
an area of course of intensive settlement set within an extensive Roman road network. There is a Roman road itself that connects Wantage with Frilford, a temple site. And you can see this road coming through Grove and Wantage here. I'm going to be talking about a variety of sites that have been excavated by Oxford Archaeology and others in the Grove and Wantage area, starting here with Grove Airfield. You can see the blue dot here showing its location. In the late Iron Age, the system of fields and enclosures was established and domestic structures as well. We have a, a roundhouse here and there's a waterfall up in, in a more open area of the settlement to the north. In the early Roman period, the uh, settlement uh, developed um, with a number of roundhouses and a further development of the enclosure system. The Middle Rome period, um, the second and early third century, saw quite a um, quite a change in the field system with an abandonment of the late Iron Age stroke early Roman system, and the landscape was essentially simplified with a, a this larger enclosure, with a sub enclosure within it, and that itself was replaced in the late Rome period with with a very interesting arrangement that the settlement was more open and we see that there was some interesting structures as well this um, post-built structure which um, is of uncertain function it could be domestic possibly a quasi villa type structure or it might have been of agricultural function perhaps a, a barn or granary something like that we also have this curious circular structure which again is of uncertain function but it, it could be a, a shrine this in this late Roman phase, we see structures like this corn dryer. And as you can see from the charred plant remains recovered from it, there is uh, evidence from the structure to suggest that it was um, used, among other things, for malting. The um, telltale signs of uh, of malting, for instance, the sprouted grains, can be seen in the in the samples extracted from the feature. There's also a, um, a millstone. This particular millstone pictured here isn't from the site, but there was a millstone recovered from the site, suggesting that a, a mill was uh, was located nearby. So, in other words, uh, crop processing was an important function of the site. In terms of livestock, you can see here that uh, cattle was uh, very important throughout the uh, Roman period. Although in the late Roman period, sheep or goat became more important. Also quite interesting are the relatively high quantities of, um, of horse bones, suggesting that a horse as well as cattle was important and that suggests the specialization of horse and uh, cattle breeding at the site. Um, some other interesting material recovered from the site was this uh, iron poker. And here we have a what could be a flesh hook. Also, an uh, interesting find was this uh, seal box, which would have been attached to documents being sent to the to the settlement. So, so we have the crop processing, we have the specialisation, but we also have some signs that the site had some had some importance of some description. Let's move to the other side of the uh, projected line of the Roman road that runs through the town to Crab Hill, again excavated by Oxford Archaeology in 2018. In the late Iron Age, we have um, a roundhouse, not not uh, not a lot else that seems that appears to be going on, but we have a, an enclosure that may have surrounded a structure. That changed quite dramatically in the early Roman period, where an enclosure system was established, um, and here we have a ditch that seems to be uh, deliberately running through this late Iron Age feature, perhaps slight that feature in some way. I have a trackway that is between these two enclosures. This basic system was uh, retained in the second century, and this area was used for crop processing, as we can see by this corn dryer here. This corn dryer dated to the late second uh, into the early third century. Corn dryers tend to be quite a uh, quite typical of the late Rome period, but here we see an earlier introduction of the technology. The uh, late Roman period at this site was, there's some continuity of course with the, uh, with the alignments of the enclosure 
but um, but the basic two enclosures had been abandoned by the stage, and we have a just a single enclosure here. Again, more crop dryers and wells, and this interesting gateway feature, which might be related to livestock management. Looking at the animal bones from this site, um, a slightly different pattern to the one at Grove Airfield, where here we see that it's a, a sheep that seems to be the important species here. But cattle, again, is, is also important, and cattle increasingly became important as the Roman period progressed. The corn dryers, um, there's forms of corn dryers here, noting crop processing. Again, malting seems to be a function of them. They've got uh, detached embryos and coleoptiles, which are the signs of, of malting. But it might be that these, these structures were multi-purpose for drying as well as malting, so not necessarily mix, uh, one or the other. So here we see a number of corn dryers established in the, uh, built in the late Roman period. Some of the finds from this site include this ads, which emphasizes the agricultural nature of the, of the activity. Moving up to the north end of Grove, at a site to the uh, west of Station Road, and on the west of the western side of the of the projected line of the Roman Road. Here we have uh, very little activity until the late Roman period. The land appears to have been very marginal for much of the Roman period, and was then in the late Roman period brought into a cultivation, some sort of other activity. And here in the late Roman period, you have this uh, field system and a looks like a trackway being established as well. So it seems to suggest that what was marginal land was uh, brought into some sort of uh, use. That area, as we progress in the late Roman period into the fourth century, was completely remodeled, and we have um, a series of enclosures and plots and domestic areas denoted by roundhouses. And um, so we have, in the late rain period, the return of the roundhouse. Right at the end of the 4th century, that system changed again, and uh, whether uh, it was a gradual process or uh, whether it was much more abrupt, the domestic side of, of the site seems to have uh, disappeared, and the land is, is brought to a quite a strictly agricultural function, where we have a, the system of stockades or, um, or, or enclosures. I mean, it could be, of course, that there was domestic settlement here. It's just um, that the, the structures, perhaps being non-earth fast, made out of, say, mass walling, um, no longer survived. But it, it does look as if that the, um, the land here was used exclusively for agricultural purposes by the very end of the Roman period. And here we can see that uh, just a summary of some of the, the plant remains and the uh, and the animal bones and a fairly uh, typical pattern uh, I'd said in the for the animal bones with cattle being a bit of a change uh, I suppose um, through the late Roman period with cattle with sheep um, becoming less important over time. No great evidence for uh, malting here from the from the corn dryers and and here the corn dryers seem to have been used more for drying rather than uh, malting. The corn dryer had uh, incidentally was a sort of T-shaped structure. Slightly, uh, the uh, cross by, if you like, was a slight angle, and that uh, that was similar to uh, another corn dryer at uh, nearby in Farringdon, um, which and perhaps you know that perhaps has a slight regional aspect to the design of of some of these structures. Nearby, well, it's part of the same different, essentially a different phase of of, of excavation of the same site uh, in an adjacent area. Another site at Monk's Farm. Evidence for, for field systems was uncovered, again dating to the late Roman period. So um, this sort of northern part seems to be very much focused on, on agricultural activity and perhaps the, um, again, bringing what was marginal land into, into use. So moving down to the south, earlier excavations by Cotswold Archaeology uncovered a uh, late Roman building and here we have an interesting trackway. And over the road at Mill Street, again by Cotswold Archaeology, various other grain stores. So towards the south end, we have various heavens of structures with both um, granaries and domestic structures. And uh, further afield, there's a evidence for a villa nearby, the East uh, Chalo. So these variety of sites, they, um, they, they seem to be a mixture of, of both high and low status sites with, with stone structures and other structures and, and areas where it's, it's very much a sort of rural farmstead 
sort of um, arrangement. We can look at the individual site status by looking at the proportion of what could be called fine and specialist ceramics. This is based on a um, on analysis work by Paul Booth, who, who who has noted that in the area in in the Upper Thames Valley, there's there's some correlation between the proportion of of these so-called fine and specialist wares and site status. And if we look at our sites in question against um, other sites in the in the Upper Thames Valley, we see that in the early Roman period, these blue bars here, the proportion, the percentage of fine and specialist wares is is not too dissimilar from from some of these uh, from, from the proportion attained by low status rural sites. Mill Street, though, the site with the grain structures, uh, seems to be quite uh, different though. It seems to have a very high proportion, uh, which I'm not quite sure exactly why that why that's very high. In the middle Rome period, um, the status seems to have gained a boost. The proportions are um, of fine specialist wares are much more akin to uh, villa or proto villas or even um, lesser nucleated settlements. And then the late Roman period, where the differences are flattened out because of the the impact of the the Oxford industry and its supply of colour coated wares, we find that the differences are much uh, less stark. But still, the um, where the percentages on the uh, Wantage Stroke Grove sites, we see that they're they're at the upper end, if you like, of of the range given here. So uh, sort of 15 stroke 20 percent, that sort of that sort of percentage. So some points for for discussion. What we're seeing then is evidence for for continuity or persistence of pre-Roman structural forms and landscape features, uh, enclosures as, and structures, but also for great disruption and change, especially in the late Roman period. We see very clear evidence for late Roman expansion and intensification of agricultural production. And we have to question why that is, and I suppose the obvious answer is the needs of the army. All these features have, uh, all these sites have corn dryers, these are multifunctional uh, structures, and but the importance of malting and by extension brewing is, is emphasised. And taken collectively, the, these sites seem to focus on, on roadside settlement activity, and, and perhaps the focus of its core of that roadside settlement is towards the south. Dentworth Road and Mill Street areas, but the uh, the site at Grove Airfield with its timber post structure that could also have some, uh, of course, be a site of some significance. And of course, um, in the early the late Iron Age and early Roman period, we're dealing with shrunk chronologies which are fairly imprecise, and so this is perhaps an area that that, that we have to be aware of when we're looking at uh, changes between the late Iron Age and the early Roman period. There's uh, with many sites we can't really distinguish between the two on, on a ceramic basis. And um, just to go to the top here, the um, looking at all these sites together, we can just emphasize the fact that that we have an individual site level. We can look at sites from an individual site basis. And of course, we know from the Roman Rural Settlement Project that big data is uh, is a very important scale on which to look at uh, these sites. But there's also an intermediate level, the local regional level, collection of sites like at Grove and Wantage, and we can look at that and get some really good ideas about quite what's going on and the interrelatedness and the relationships between these sites. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to the three papers so far. Um, I'm Martin Allen. We've now got an opportunity uh, to ask some questions and discuss some of the information that um, we've been listening to for, for, the, for the last hour. Hopefully uh, you've enjoyed it and have uh, a lot to a lot to think about and lots to, to talk about and um, you can type questions into the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen um, and we have a, a distinguished panel of um, uh, of guests here tonight will help uh, help us take take us through this uh, can I remind everybody that there is a feedback form as well in the uh, chat option and we'd really be grateful for anybody pull those out so we can uh, you know See how see what you thought about the talks, see what you thought about the seminars, and see how we can improve things in the future. Um, so I'd just like to introduce our panel uh, that we have again that Ken mentioned them earlier. We have Dr. Lacey Wallace from the University of Lincoln, uh, Dr. Nick, Nick Hodgson from the University of Durham, uh, formerly with Tyne and Weir Museums. We have Dr. Ellery Cousins from the University of Lancaster. Uh, Dr. Steve Willis joins us from the University of Kent. We also have Paddy Lambert from Oxford Archaeology East and Rachel Newman from Oxford Archaeology North. 
So I'm now going to hand over to our chair for the uh, remainder of the session, uh, Dr. Lacey Wallace, welcome. Thanks, Martin. And thank you um, to all of the speakers. I think everybody you know, really enjoyed that. That was, um, you know, obviously it's always awesome seeing, uh, seeing sites that you're not familiar with get explained. So thanks so much. Um, the north and west versus south and east, you know, sort of traditional regional divisions um, are, you know, kind of, I think, maybe something that, that we're all talking about here. But what, what um, we're not focusing on, you know, as, uh, as everybody has said, is that usually that division is borne out by, you know, this is where the high status is, this is where the, you know, the south and east is where you find the villas, where you find most of the um, the temples where, you know, there's a, a greater proportion of material culture and architectural elaboration, whereas the north and west, you know, is characterized as the military, um, a ceramic and, and just extremely different. The rural settlement project not having that um, FOSS way, you know, as their division um, makes it, you know, makes it less uh, significant. and. I think, you know, it might be interesting to start off by asking you, Martin, to um, to kind of talk about how the project, not looking at that that traditional um, divide, but rather using these um, these different regions affected how, how you would sort of revise, you know, what everybody, I think, has stuck in their heads as the north and west versus the south and east. Yeah, we we very deliberately wanted to get away from that because that's such the uh, the traditional approach, and we we wanted to see how much variation we were getting within regions. It's not just this north south divide. I mean, you can look at just the south region and see you know immense variation uh, just within different landscapes, which um, I showed a, a you know a couple of graphs just in, in terms of settlement morphologies and what you were getting on in upland areas compared to lowland areas. You could um, you know, you could add data, layer data over the top of it, you know, animal bone data, you could add small fine data and find these, these differences within the regions themselves, um, which don't, you know, necessarily correspond just to this, you know, as you say, high status, low status things you get uh, north and south. So we really wanted to get away from that generalization. You did see it with with other things. I mean, you know, you point to the the, the pottery data that that graph I showed at the end. So you you see it in broad terms, but you've really got to. Although the the big data projects are really important to show those those broad patterns, it's when you drill down into the regional areas, as you know, what Ed was showing and, and what John was showing, that that you know you get this really quite stark differences between settlements um, within quite quite small small areas uh, and that's what's really interesting trying to pick that apart and um, so that that was the the basis of the project really to try and get away from that exactly okay good so <laughs> that's clear for everybody now and the um you know the focus on the fact that obviously the roman period in britain was primarily agricultural um looking at the lack of integration into the local you know market economy in in those sites in the north is really interesting because you know i think we're all convinced that it's an agricultural economy but putting so much emphasis on on not having that material culture or not having you know either access to or desire to or valuing um that type of integration makes it you know probably much more interesting to us about what this what that actually means and thinking about what status you know we we're talking about maybe cattle but thinking about what status actually you know might have meant to people not what it means to us we love architectural elaboration and mosaics and we see status in that sense but you know what ed was just saying about you know being able to identify high status sites on you know on a site that's just a corn dryer and some enclosures um, by looking at it in a different way you know looking at it in these specialized ceramics i think that's um i think that's really neat and obviously that's a way of breaking down this kind of villa mentality that um people often have sorry ed i was just re referring to your stuff without asking you specifically but do, do you want to um well i i i, I should uh, i should say that that i can't i can't take uh, cre uh, credit cre uh, to, i i can't uh, i i mean the uh, the um uh, looking at the breaking it down into those fine and specialist ways is is something i said in my talk that uh, that my former colleague paul booth um worked out but there are rather there are other sort of measures that that that, that pottery specialists tend to employ 
these sort of things. And 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 um, uh, I mean, I, I, know, I know, I mean, of course, Steve Willis is here, and and and, he, and he's been looking at in the past. He's looked at semen and looked at the the, uh, the proportion of of, uh, of of different semen types and uh, and forms. Um, and 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 this has led led to some 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 some, some uh, um, um, differentiation between sites that perhaps uh, uh, on some looking at morphology and and sites and 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 the and the and the layout of sites that you wouldn't necessarily be able to pick out. But but um, the um, and and the, and we do see regional uh, um, uh, trends with 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 things like semen. But I mean, I suppose the the, the broad point is that yes, I mean the. I suppose the the, the, um, the 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 main point is that the emphasis is is on on quantification of pottery, which I, I always say that that we need that, and and this is um, uh, and 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 all the pottery is important as well, and it's not just not just the uh, you know collecting the you know all these the 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 the, the, uh, the, the well preserved pottery, it's it, it's it, it, and from and from and from key groups, it's it's looking at pottery from across. Uh, uh, for, uh, is 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 having a fairly uh, comprehensive collection of uh, uh, strategy for of flat, flat material. So I, th I think it's still important to to, to look at uh, to uh, to pick up all that pottery. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of rambling on with that, with that, with that question. But I, but, uh, but um, I think that um, yeah, I mean it's um, um, uh, yes, we we have to um, um, yeah. There are, there, are, there are various measures, various. Um, Means of looking at status, and and even the most these even the most humble hum, the even the most humble shirts, I think, can tell us a story. Yeah, and John, what would you say? Um, you know, in a, in a part of the country where they're basically, you know, you could come home with a shoebox of pottery from a huge open area site. Yeah, that's right. Um, in the northwest, I mean, a, a rural site um, with a thousand shirts is, you know, it's the, that's a mega assemblage. I can only think of two, I think, off the top of my head that produce anything like that. And they're in um, kind of Merseyside, Cheshire, right on the southern periphery. Um, so clearly on the evidence we've got, and it is very limited evidence, I have to say, um, as I think my talk showed, um, people weren't able to access or have felt no need to access um, uh, Roman supply networks and, and use Roman goods. Now, why that should be um, is another matter. Um, it could be that, that certain communities felt no need to shift from their traditional use of, um, in the terms of, in, in container terms, um, utensils of leather and wood and, and basketry and things like that. Um, I do wonder, though, whether um we might even look at at um not just looking at, at communities or groups of communities but individuals as well i mean even today you know some people find status in you know buying a flash car or uh, wearing designer clothes and some of us couldn't care less about that kind of thing um i i suspect that at the micro level that was the same in in roman britain you know you get individuals in any given community you might be more up for engaging with uh, Roman material culture than others rather than a, a blanket um, um, lack of interest from a given community or a group of communities so yeah. I think it's going to be very variable across the region and across um, any given any given site really with with some people more interested in that um, expression of status than others yeah, and not just identifying poverty as sort of, you know, low material culture equals some kind of poverty. Mm, quite. Should uh, we just look at the um, Q&A? Uh, Martin is answering Jane's question. Do you want to just pop in an answer in there? We could discuss it, but. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave that. Um, just so that we keep up with this, although there aren't that many, so but we'll just ask this one. Uh, we have Simon Clark asking about plowing at Stanek. Says, looks like all or most of the plowing is in one direction. Does this indicate more advanced plows than the prehistoric ard type, perhaps a multi board plow? Very specific agricultural question. Can uh, John answer that? Um, that is correct. Most of the plow marks were in one particular direction, but there was some evidence. Well, there is some evidence for cross-plowing as well 
um, with some of the um, plow marks going um, more or less perpendicular to the main alignment. Now, I'm not an expert in, in agricultural implements, I'm, af I'm afraid. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, certainly the um, plows must have been cutting fairly deep, I think, into uh, scoring the natural subsoil. Um, but whether they were um, what form of uh, plough was being used, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not able to say. Yeah, I'm sure that's something that is going to be, you know, have regional differences as well. It's not, it's not my knowledge area either. Interesting. Um, Martin, the one that you've answered, do you, should, do you want to chat about that? So there's a question on the development of ditch trackways, and there's been quite a lot of work on that, particularly in areas such as the Upper Thames Valley, where they become, so they seem to be very common, common from around the second century onwards, and they seem to, the, the, the fact they're being delineated and marked out from the second century through to the fourth century appears to uh, run in tandem with the expansion of dick, um, complex farmsteads. So they appear to be linked and we think that, you know, they're quite important in terms of increasing in interconnectivity um, uh, in that region. Um, and, uh, you know, if you go into other regions, you, know, you get ditch, ditch trackways certainly up in, in the northeast, but a lot of them are already there by the late Iron Age. Um, so there's different things happening in different parts of the country, um, but they, they, they seem to be, you know, whether they're, you know, it is all to do with drainage. Um, but also to do with, you know, potentially to do with, you know, land division, um, ownership in different areas. There's, you know, there's a lot of questions. You know, Paul Booth wrote a really interesting paper on ditch trackways, certainly in Oxfordshire. I think that's you know, going back about 10, 20 years ago now. So, but, um, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of work that can be done on ditch trackways. Yeah, and the latter settlements, I think you're referring to in the, in the Northeast, yes. the ditches, you know, is sort of like a central ditch often that or, the, the, the enclosures are then organized around and mm. what that ditch is for, it seems to just divide the settlement in half, you know, rather than yeah, completely. serve as a, as a trackway, but obviously is like really important and maintained and that, or, you know, or, or intentionally filled in and built over. Um, yeah. I'm sure Steve is familiar, has some of those in his area too. Lincolnshire. Hi, Nick. Nick, you're on mute. Could, could I come in and um, um, go back to what John was was saying about characterizing um, his settlements in the Northwest? Um, I, I think it's important to make the point, uh, especially for, for the Southerners in the audience, that um, while, while we're talking about a North-South divide, and, and certainly Edward's paper demonstrated that it is a different world down there from up up here in the north. Um, it, it is more complicated than that because there is also within the north, from a northern perspective, there's very much an east-west divide. And um, I'm sure John would agree that the, um, the rural landscape he's characterized is not really what we see in the northeast at all. And in their own period in the Northeast, um, you, you do get um, the development of um, villas. I mean, it's um, on a, a lesser scale than in certain areas in the South, but it, it does take place. Um, and there are um, small towns, nucleated settlements, various kinds. And there are also complex farmsteads. Of, of various kinds which, which develop and none of these things well very few of them anyway or, well certainly no villas no, no, no towns apart from Carlisle in the, in the northwest um, so the Pennines do seem to be a, a great dividing line now of course there is a great difficulty here in that this could just arguably be a product of the modern um, archaeological planning system in that you also have far less econo modern economic development 
on the west side of the Pennines and therefore less um, planning type archaeology taking place. But even so, um, I think m most people would go along with the, the view that this is, this is a real different that, that was apparent in Roman time. And I don't think any of us really understand quite well why it is, but it's, it's there. So it's in the north anyway, there's an east-west division, which is just as dramatic as any north-south division you want to talk about. Just as you were saying you didn't know why it was, Ellery and Steve. So. <laughs> I come in on that because it relates to kind of what you were saying at the start, Lucy, about, you know, yes, absolutely, that one of the things that was so sort of revolutionary and, and incredibly useful about the the Roman settlement, the rural Roman settlement project was was that starting from the idea of kind of regions rather than sort of preconceived sort of cultural divides and that that north south divide and so forth. Um, and you know, breaking down that traditional divide of military north, civilian south is something that instinctively I really want to be doing. But at the same time, you know, when I when I when we look at kind of settlement in the north north, right? And and of course you're right about the Pennines divide in it, but but much of that evidence is really sort of Yorkshire evidence, right? Sort of south of south of the wall, shall we say. Um, uh, I keep on coming back to, I keep on having to confront, right, that you can't avoid the, the idea that this is a militarized landscape, right, that, that, that the Roman army seems to be having an incredibly outsized effect on what is happening, right, and we just can't, we can't, I find myself unable to get away from that, right, and when, when, uh, when John is talking about, uh, you know, looking at Maryport and Broome versus these other little settlements that we have, um, uh, you know, at what point do we have to also kind of accept that there is, you know, still an explanatory value <laughs> to a heavy Roman army presence having a really outsized effect on what's happening in rural communities? I don't know. I mean, because Nick, you know, even the sort of work that's been done in these, as you say, there's, there's very, as, as, as you have done, right, as those complex settlements that we're seeing around the wall, but that also the wall and, and the militarization of that landscape has a really disruptive effect. Yeah, well, I, I don't think one would doubt that. Yeah. I mean, to back up what you're saying, if you look at the long term military presence in the north, off. the weight of it not all of it but the weight of it is on the west side of the Pennines um, where, where precisely you have the, um, the, 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 the the lack of the Roman type developments that we've been talking about um, exactly I mean for me if we're looking for an explanation here right it's it's armed and belted men yeah. um, but I, I don't know, it's, it, it's got to be more complicated than that. I mean, for example, um, you know, in, in the Northeast, you have the Legion. There's only one Legion, and it's based in York. And that's right in the centre of the most developed agricultural landscape with the most villas, the most complex farms, and, and so on. And um, so I, it's, I don't think it's quite that simple, not, not to me. Um, I, 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 I think there were, um, I, I, I think there's a difference between the east and west side of the Pennines that goes back to pre-Roman Iron Age times. And we're seeing that somehow uh, perpetuated within the, the Roman provincial setup. Steve, I think you wanted to come in there. Well, we, I mean, um, indeed, I mean, if you go back to the Iron Age, there is a profound east-west difference. Um, and, and we see that in coin use and we see that in pottery use. Um, and that sort of thing was identified, obviously, by Cyril Fox. If you go back to the personality of Britain, um, the influence on um, inhabitant and invader was his, sub, was his subtitle. 
Um, obviously, we're seeing it written large. Now we've had 30 years plus of commercial archaeology. It's underscored the trends which were already there. That's profoundly, profoundly interesting. Um, what, what um, playing the devil's advocate, what I'd like to uh, say is why didn't the Romans stop on the Fos frontier or when they saw what it was like in the north and the west, why didn't they withdraw to a margin scape along the Fos frontier? Because they could see what it was like. Um, I think I know the answer to that, but there was this heavy investment in garrisoning, you know, Wales, the southwest, the Pennines, the North. Why did they invest all of that um, effort to garrison and pay those troops? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to see what other people may think of that. You know, if we if we level it up to imperial policy and and you know the rollout of the imperial project. To me, the answer is very simple. There are a lot of minerals in the north and west in the upland regions, particularly lead, which produces silver. And indeed, there is some evidence of smelting lead in places like Carlisle, as well as um, mining it. There is increasingly dated evidence from the Coldback Hills and from the Olsen mines. And same well, goes to the southwest, I suspect, as well. What else could there be, though, that Rome might be interested in uh, in that area that it does garrison and beyond to make it worthwhile? Can I come in on this? I think uh, people are the big, one of the biggest ones. I think I think the slave trade is something that we don't talk about quite enough. Yeah, and I yeah, think I, I think the the human chattel, if you like, is uh, a, a massive economic consideration because I also think it's also about a badge of identity to own somebody from Britain, which was quite literally the periphery of the world. And I think we, we lose some of that nouveau richness of society from the Mediterranean world, if you like, from you study any panegyrics about Britain at all from the fourth century, and they're all talking about how Britain is awful and is populated by wild people. So I think part of that is also owning a lot of these people as well it was the exact I, I imagine it was exactly the same from people from germany so i think that was a large part of it but i think the complexity of which is is probably almost insurmountable because it is large part i think um we're looking at i don't know we're looking at the industrial consideration but i think people and the economic passage of people and slaves i think is a big part as well um but not probably the biggest i think it's a, a large a large component and a very, very big consideration. So some of those people could perhaps be captives who are traded into the empire, perhaps from Ireland or Scotland. Um, and then perhaps in the area that's garrisoned, that might be uh, fertile for military recruitment, perhaps for auxiliaries. Does, does Nick have a view on that? Do you think there were, you know, was a, it was a recruiting ground where there already were forts for um, auxiliary soldiers? Uh. Well, it's possible. Uh, I can't think of any sort of really good direct evidence for that. But but it's interesting you mentioned Scotland and Ireland because I was going to come in after Paddy and say add one more factor to answer your question, which is precisely that of external threats. The reason they wanted to um, hold everything up to Hadrian's Wall was if they gave that up, um, you know. <laughs> the, um, the 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 lost area would rapidly have become taken over by the, the, the people who would have raided the remaining part of the province, arguably. Um, and Ireland was always a great strategic strategic issue. That's why there were always two legionary fortresses kept in Wales um, long after the advance to further north. It's, um, they, they were aware of the, the potential of the threat from the un, unconquered parts of Britain, or the British Isles, I should say. We're really getting into talking about the, um, the sort of rulers here, <laughs> um, when actually like, the talks were about the farmsteads. So <laughs> maybe we could, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redirect by just answer, by, uh, posing Jane Hanbridge's question here. Um, about complex farms to, actually hold on no i'm going to go back because uh, that 
it's Nick Wilson. Did some of the roundhouses in the excavations have two entrances? I wouldn't have thought so. Did anybody think that one of the plans, some of the plans looked like they had two entrances? Yes. Um, several sites in the Northwest oh. um, have roundhouses, evidence for roundhouses with opposed entrances um, in the in the form of the ring gullies just, just terminating um, in causeways at either opposed opposed ends of the of the roundhouse. That's quite a common feature. Um, there were examples certainly at Bulkhouse Farm and at Polton. Um, not quite sure about Preston East. They weren't quite well uh, preserved enough. But certainly uh, when we were researching those sites, I found many more parallels in the northwest and indeed further afield in Wales. Um, so yes, it seems to be quite a common feature, at least regionally in the, in the northwest. Um, what's the benefit of that? I think it would just make it drafty. <laughs> yeah, quite. Um, I don't know is the short answer to that. Um, there was one site, I think it might have been Polton, where one of the entrances seemed to have been blocked um, with a post. And now, whether that was just because they got fed up with a with a gale whistling through the, the house or there was some a strange kind of votive going on when the, the it's been speculated, I think, on probably on no good evidence that that some of these post entrances might have been for the ancestors, for example, to access the building uh, with the other with the other yeah. entrance for the living. Now, whether that's the case or not, I don't think there's any good evidence to say one way or the other. But it's it's an hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. Is there any passioning there in terms of size of roundhouses that have these double entrances, or is it just kind of across the board? Um, the big one at Barker House Farm, 15 metres diameter, had opposed entrances, but there are also examples of, of the more usual eight to nine metre diameter ones as well, so size doesn't appear to be a factor. Um, Martin, maybe you can look at um, Jane's question here. Evidence of difference in the Lapria or or um, earlier in all of these regions. I mean, Jane, I can tell you the answer is yes. <laughs> um, there's major differences across across the Iron Age. Does anyone want to? I mean, anyone can really can really jump in on that. I mean, Steve was talking about um, I think the well the Laten, you know, sort of northeast. Um, and Ellery's talking about a very different Northwest, for example, but it is across the whole, the whole of Britain. If anybody wants to make a specific comment for Jane Hanbridge there. Yeah, Rachel. Our real problem in the Northwest is we don't really have an Iron Age. We've got a few dead bodies now, which is better than we had before, but um, we have very little that we can put our hand on our heart and say is definitely Iron Age. And indeed, one of the problems, as John's alluded to, is we have these nice typologically Iron Age um, sites that when we dig them turn out to be early Roman. Um, so we're, I think the missing Iron Age is one of the big research questions for the Northwest as a whole. Yeah, I mean, reflecting on the, the, the South a little bit more, I think, you know, that there's a lot of continuity from the late Iron Age. You know, the, the landscape is already set up, you know, you, you get the conquest and the army moving through, but effectively, you know, the, 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 the landscape is managed in much the same way it did, it did in the Iron Age. Um, you know, you, it's just certain people are given different power in different areas, you know, with Kiva Dest capitals being developed in certain places, but the, 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 the infrastructure is already there, but you start to see, you know, new changes develop probably in the second century more than you do around the conquest period. You know, as the landscape becomes more intensively um, exploited, and that's when you start seeing investment in farmsteads, you start seeing investment in architecture, you start seeing investment in things like animal husbandry, uh, and it's all to do with, I think, making a profit really, and um, you know, wider developments in the landscape. So, it, it's layered, is my answer to that, and it goes right through to the late Roman period. There's there's continuity and change. It depends on what you're looking at. I, I think that's a, I, I, sorry. I, I think that's a really good point, uh, Martin, because I think that's exactly what's happening in the first century. Is that the Romans are very, very good, especially the imperial administration. They're very good at capitalising on what's already there. 
So I think if we can use the Roman conquest in the first century as um, a prism through which to see the Iron Age before, we start to see something incredibly sophisticated, especially in the Eastern region with us around Cambridgeshire, uh, not so much Norfolk and, and Suffolk, but around Cambridgeshire, you see very, very highly developed Iron Age communities. And the Romans aren't really trying to change too much, but of course, um, a little known woman from Norfolk in the 60s AD kind of changed all of that. And then we start seeing in the second century around, around Hadrian accession, around the 117th, like you said, we start to see a real exploitation. And I think that's the word none of us have really used just yet. And I think that's exactly what it is. It is hardened exploitation. And I think we're also missing the elephant in the room of they are, Britain is part of the Roman empire here. So this exploitation is, is, is profit, but who's it profit for? And I think it's, it's largely to feed the military machination of, of the Roman empire itself. And I think that is what Britain is for. And I, I know you mentioned in your talk about the um, the golden age of Roman Britain, and I think it was I think it was a pretty dreadful place to live um, between the between the periods of forty three to four ten. Um, but I think the golden age obviously is when it Britain became a vital organ in the body politic of the Roman Empire at this point, and it changed from that peripheral element. And I think that's a really good point. And I think that also comes into the uh, Jane's wonderful question about the trackways as well. Because that's when, you, like we said, we, you start to see a regularization of field systems. And what they seem to be is um, they seem to show some kind of like penorial or social links that are, again, they're reinforcing. But it's all about the movement of resources. I think pragmatism is something we need. And it's a wet place. Britain is a nasty wet place. And yet it's agriculturally rich. And it's all about moving uh, resources, especially with trackways, whether it mirrors Roman roads. A road is a road. It's a point from going from A to B. So in that in that context, I think so, definitely. Yeah, but there's a huge difference between um, the or there's a huge difference as as there seems to be more of a of a centralization of processing and storage and distribution as time goes on. That um, I don't think it's necessarily. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure you're suggesting it's like driven by. The military or the administration's needs. I mean, I think there's there's plenty of room for just regular people wanting to be ambitious and selfish and not be very nice <laughs> to their tenants. You know, um, I think that's a, that, that is a, absolutely. I think that's um, it's the thing. It's the complexity of it, isn't it? It's 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 six of one, half a dozen the other. It's never one thing. I think. I think we're dealing with human, complex people, and largely. They're all out for themselves. So if they're doing it in the name of Rome, who cares? As long as Rome gets their forty percent or whatever of whatever produce, it's in our best interest, if you like, to produce as much as possible, whether that's people or sheep and wool or livestock or anything. But then I think large some parts of that, especially from the second century onwards, is dictated by the Roman state almost for sure. And I think that as long you know, it's in our best interest to make more because they're taking more. When, when we saw um, when we saw the uh, those fantastic slides of the sites around um, the northwest, um, one of the striking aspects there was how green the grass was, um, which is just reminding us, indeed, as you said, you were saying uh, there, uh, Paddy, you know uh, how 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 wet the, the the landscape of Britain is, and how suitable, obviously, it is in the west the west of Britain for for raising cattle. Uh, and presumably that is a tradition that goes on through the Iron Age. I know that um, Sue Stalibras has been contributing to the chat here. And the raising of cattle and wealth through cattle um, is, and, their, and their secondary products, of course, is, is probably quite central. Um, so perhaps some of those cattle and their, their, their secondary products are being traded you know, uh, as a form of exchange for taxation. Um, uh, but the thing is, what's going back in the other direction? It seems to be nothing. Um, in terms of material culture or coinage or, you know, we don't get the hordes, we don't get the, the Samian pottery, we don't even get the Mortaria in these sites of, of Western Britain. So they're really not buying, in, over centuries, they're not buying into the, the opportunities, and there were opportunities, you know, within the Roman Empire. Um, and, it's, and, and they're remaining, you know, a, a, a separate sphere across the same geography, across the same landscape that all these massively uh, articulated military sites and garrisons and VK, which are being constantly supplied with all the, the um, 
uh, attributes of what it is to be centralized within the Roman Empire. They're rejecting all that over, over, over centuries. It really is quite remarkable how there is an absence of you know, what we used to think of as Romanization there. And it really does go back you know, through these roots. Um, and we're seeing it you know, time and again now when these sites are being excavated. One thing I'd just uh, point out, and I think that uh, Nick was alluding to this, if we go back over to the eastern side of the, of the Pennines, it's a little bit more Roman there, but um, things are always complicated. So the site that we looked at, the villa site at Ingleby Barwick, near to Stockton on Tees, that had a, a, a what you might think of a, as a fairly sort of normal suite of um, stone-founded buildings with a, with a bath block, et cetera, and a, and a, a villa-type um, morphology to it. But so it had all the, had all the architecture, but the, there, was a, there was a very, very small number of coins. There was a very small pottery assemblage. And there were more, even more remarkable, there was, a, there was only a tiny number of iron nails. So these buildings were presumably putting, being put together with um, you know, wooden nails, pegs, carpentry in a vernacular sort of fashion, which we wouldn't see you know, or, you know, in sites even down into, into uh, the Vale of York, maybe, where, you know, where we might expect you know, hundreds of hundreds of iron nails. So it's a very complicated picture where you've got like a, a, a architecturally a, a stone villa with the, with the furnishings, but the material culture is missing. Mm. Ellery, you're nodding. Are you nodding with intent? No. Not with terrible intent, no, no. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because I wonder what people think, like it, the concept of, you know, mutual indifference, these separate spheres, just because they don't impinge on each other and they don't care rather than trying to read everything as like, um, you know, being excluded or, or uh, you know, rejecting that way of life, whereas just getting on with your subsistence agriculture and not necessarily needing or, or ever finding any value in kind of integrating into a you know completely different economy completely different way of cooking food and dressing and everything i mean uh, so, uh, sorry uh um to, go ahead oh no no I, 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 I was just wondering if i could just jump in here and and um talk in this perhaps in slightly vague terms about the cultural the cult, cultural in cultural environment and and we, we're talking about different cultural environments, even within the same geographical environment. And I think that's and, that, and I think that's important. And these cultural environments can be uh, grown and, and uh, um, developed and sustained over many many generations. And and um, you know uh, cultural practices um, uh, um, were essentially passed on. Uh, it, it's just an intergenerational thing, and and, and, the, 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 and, and we could see 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 there's sort of got these sort of cultural practices being passed on to, to the next generation, and and therefore that's sustained. Just 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 just, just like like you know, sort of, uh, uh, essentially culture is, and and and, I, and, I, and, I, and so I think I think there's an element of that, and and we, we can, I mean, you know, there, there has been some interesting work uh, looking at um, uh, ceramics in in in, in, in 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 other parts of Britain, in Eastern Britain, for instance. Looking at how how um, uh, dis distributions of, of 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 ceramics isn't uh, uh, there's some oddities where we think well there's there's no reason why one part of um, or, or, or one why, why one part of the region might not have certain ceramics but other but the, but, the, but the next door region has has that has a certain type of ceramic in abundance and. And, the, and there must be some sort of, and it's nothing to do with geography so much, or or straight, or um, or or or, or routeways, but, but perhaps some sort of cultural um, um, isolation, uh, uh, essentially, which is preventing uh, that that uh, that uh, those, those ceramics being taken up. Um, there, there's simply no no sort of habit in in, in perhaps in some regions why things be, will be, uh, uh, and and no, those ideas aren't passed on, and um, it. Um, it's um, um, so. I mean, so I I I, 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 like, I like to be thinking. I like to think in those terms, which are all, all a bit sort of vague, really. But but um, but you know, um, if 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 there's simply no no um, um, if uh, you know if um, if 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 um, if if uh, if if um, if if a, um, uh, a, a group of society isn't using same, for instance, there's no reason why the why why 
why that the idea of saving is being passed on to the next generation. And so it's that's going to sustain that sort of lack of, of take up. Coming at this from a different angle, sorry, can I? Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things to come back to the Northwest, which I feel is so full of weird questions, right? And, you know, that point that you made, John, about these sites that you've, you know, those three sites that you were talking about, that they are actually very close to Roman road networks. Um, you know, I'm sitting here in Lancaster University, you know, not very far away from, from the Barker House farm site. And we are very, very close here to, to Lancaster and that settlement. But also, you know, if I'm thinking about the kind of broader landscape that we've got up here, you know, we're at a sort of pivot point where you can then head up a, the next valley over where um, at, at Cormer we have evidence of sort of Roman, you know, pottery production happening there that seems to be related again to the fort at Lancaster. This is a landscape where, you know, it's, what's happening at the fort in Vicus is, is connected to other sites that are happening in the countryside. And, you know, I think you're absolutely right that there has to be an explanation for that. Um, for why these sites seem to be so resolutely unplugged in to those other sites. Um, I don't know how one differentiates between sort of active choice and this idea that you were bringing up ahead of, you know, sort of, yes, different cultural geographies on top of the same geography, or the physical geography, versus, again, coming back to this idea of to what extent are these being actively excluded from that, from those networks? You know, I don't know. I feel like I'm becoming reactionary in my old age, which is a bit alarming because I, I'm not really in my old age yet. But, you know, that, that <laughs> idea of sort of uh, active rejection of Roman culture, which is kind of where I want to be going. I'm finding myself being drawn back again to sort of, to what extent is this exclusion? I don't know. The thing that troubles me is taxes. I can't imagine Barker House Farm not being subject to taxes. And so yeah, tax it's not like natural. it's not like they're invisible, right? Yeah. <laughs> this this would be the, the Roman authorities would not have missed that site given the nature, you know, where it where it's sitting in the landscape. Well, it, it depends on how you're being taxed. If you don't have coins, you're not paying in coins, are you? So is, is it still the wealth in livestock? In the and I region? guess they're a question, and, and I'd be interested, you know, John and Rachel, the amount of time that you sort of spent up excavating up here, do you think this would be looking different if we had better preservation of animal bone? Or any preservation of animal bone. <laughs> yeah, it would help, certainly. <laughs> Another factor must be, you know, how things are marketed and traded. Um, and if people aren't going to a market to exchange things, perhaps the, perhaps the army or a, a Roman official is coming around to collect goods in kind. Um, there's no, there's no centralisation where people are coming together where they're going to see, you know, um, whetstones from the southeast or particular types of quernstones that might be more efficient, you know, or, or other processed goods. So that sort of awareness, that habit that um, Ed was talking about, and I think it, you know, that, that, that the idea of the habit, we, we often think about habit in terms of um, Britain not having a, um, an, a, a habit of um, epigraphy in terms of stone inscriptions. Well, you know, we, um, certain, certain spheres obviously didn't have a, a ceramic habit. They may have had a consciousness of it, but they didn't have it as a, as a habit. So it's a question of, you know, marketing and, you know, who's coming to market and, uh, who's going to be there at that market? It, it seems that um, that uh, many people are, you know, uh, officially or um, through free enterprise, taking goods to military complexes um, out of the south of the east of England into um, into the west and the north. But um, the the local populations are not articulating with that. So the material is there, um, and I don't think they're being excluded. Uh, because there's no evidence for that, we do see we do see um, items, you know, turning up. I don't think there's any so there's no evidence of any social restriction on distribution of of, of material culture. So we have to think about you know um, the the marketing of things and how things are distributed and, and made available. Um, but as I, I say, there's a, a remarkable continuity. Marketing, but also you know consideration of your of your peer group that you know you would care 
because you have this peer group with you know that has shared values and histories and memories and 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 whatever so if there's if there's no need for if you don't have the benefit you know from your your peers you don't have some kind of benefit to acquiring this stuff that you don't realize why you need it you know it's gucci shoes to an archaeologist i think that's a very good point if i could just um, hog the limelight for a moment is on the eastern side of uh, of britain we see we see in the first century ad we see samian pottery going to sites that we can see by other indices are quite high status they have they have indigenous origins but they're receptive uh, to samian that's the vanguard of Roman material culture going to those sites. And many of those sites develop into villas. So there's a consciousness, it would seem, amongst elite communities to um, access this material or it's being deliberately traded to them. And, and what actually they have isn't the, the cups and dishes so much as the decorated bowls, the really fancy stuff. And they, they presumably have it because their you know, elite neighbours you know, some way down the road have it as well, because it's not turning up at every rural site, it's turning up at those sites that we can see by other indices, uh, are higher status and, and or develop into villas. So that peer aspect uh, and um, conspicuous consumption is, is still very relevant. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the peer group are the ones who define what is high status. We don't, not us saying it's Roman or whatever, that, you know, that would have no meaning potentially, you know, to the well, the Rudston Villa Mosaic Ellery, <laughs> for example, <laughs> written about that. Um, we are coming down to having only three and a half minutes. Um, and I know that Martin wants to just come in right at the end to say uh, a quick um, summing or, well, goodbye and, and looking forward to the next thing. So could we just look at the, um, at the questions and just see if there's anything in there that anybody wants to particularly um, come in on simon clark says is there evidence that animal bone and grain is mainly locally sourced at the wiki and forts what's the mechanism of mobilization and surplus that is a big question simon <laughs> um but sourced at the four i mean animal bone and grain obviously is going to come from agricultural and rural sites like the ones we were looking at and possibly end up at the wiki and forts um john did you want to well, I mean, there is some evidence from from the sites I mentioned, and I think elsewhere that you know, at least some of the inhabitants of the Viki were actually farming. Um, there are field systems. Oh yeah, you said that. Yeah. There are field systems. Um, other features of managed ag agricultural landscape um, around uh, the fort at Maryport, particularly on geophysical evidence, uh, and also at Broom. Um, the Broom site was a was a pipeline that traversed quite. Uh, large areas around the core area of the settlement and, and everywhere there were there were many features suggestive of of field systems ditch field systems um, watering holes presumably for for livestock um, so yeah i mean i dare say a good a fair amount of, of produce was was um reaching the viki from um other settlements in the area but i i suspect a reasonable amount of of foodstuffs was being produced on site. Yeah, because they're village sized, aren't they? There's no yeah, reason yeah. that number of people could access the fields. You know, it's not like it's miles distant to get to the other end of the settlement. No, not at all. I mean, they're, they're mostly ribbon development. And as you say, you know, there's, there's, they're going to have a substantial population. But um, the fields start, you know, basically, um, you know, just at the back of your back of your building plot. Um, at Maryport by the looks of things and probably at uh, Broome and probably elsewhere too we just don't have the evidence in the northwest from from most of the VK sites but I see no reason why why it shouldn't be similar um than most of the most of the the VK sites in the region I'd agree with John but I I want to drop just drop one um fairly large brick into the the pond which is this is in a very different context in that it was um Roman reuse of, of uh, in fact, a chariot burial, or the ditch around a chariot burial. But there, there was an awful lot of cattle bone. This is over in Yorkshire, of course, because we don't get cattle bone in the northwest. But there, um, it was quite clear from some of the isotope work that was done that cattle were being drawn from a very, very wide area, brought into Yorkshire, and then slaughtered for whatever purposes one can say ritual um, 
at this very place and some was being drawn as far afield as as um, Scotland. So if they're doing that for ritual purposes, how much more are they doing it for military and consumable purposes? So I think there is no let on on the fact that that animals are being moved very long distances. Yeah, I think you're right, Rachel. We do have evidence for long distance movement of of livestock. I mean, um, I mean that is a you know, that's a ritual context you're talking about there. But you know, if you look at the forts and some of the vikis, they they must be exploiting their local landscape. But you look at the animal bone evidence uh, where you get it at those sites. There are large dumps of cattle. Um, high proportions of cattle and they're being butchered and processed very very similarly to the way that they're being butchered and processed at towns in southern Britain in a rapid um, way by professional butchers. Now I, I just uh, I can't see that you've got that many cattle coming in to feed that many people and thinking about all the secondary products just being fed from the local area. I suspect it's it's layered. You're getting movement of cattle north from the south, we've got you know evidence for you know other items, black burnish ware going right up to Hadrian's Wall. You know what's that carrying? What's it signifying? Is that grain going north? Uh, other items going north. So we do have this system of products going north as well, as well as settlements being able to look after themselves. So it's it's more complicated than one or the other, I think. All right. Well, I'm afraid we have to wrap that up. Um, thank you, everyone, to the speakers, to the panelists, to everybody who asked such great questions. This was really fun. Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, Martin, to, to sign us off. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, thank you to Lacey for uh, sharing it so well, keeping us all in line. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you for everyone who's, um, who's come and listened. Um, the talks are all going to go up on YouTube. So if you uh, missed anything or want to see it again, um, we will send out information on our social media channels. Um, keep a lookout on the website. Um, and if anybody really enjoyed it, please come back. We are going to be doing our next seminar, our fifth seminar on the early medieval period as well. So that proves to be, you know, I, I hope that's going to be as interesting as this one. Thank you very much to everybody. Oh, and also the feedback form, which is on the chat. If you scroll right up on the chat, you'll be able to download the feedback form. All feedback will be gratefully received. So thank you to all the panelists. Thank you especially to Lacey for chairing. Um, and thank you also to Liz Popescu who's organized all of this. Um, she's been rather silent up to now, but if it wasn't for Liz, this wouldn't have happened. Thank you all. <laughs>